Hello everyone and welcome back for another lecture. We are on lecture five, part one, getting into weathering. We first started with this topic last lecture when we were discussing sedimentary rocks, structures, and depositions. Uh, so first let's start by redefining what these terms are. Number one, weathering is the physical breakdown uh, of rocks from their larger pieces, their rocks, boulders, cobbles, pebbles, whatever they may be, into smaller and smaller pieces uh, due to exposure to the atmosphere, uh, primarily wind and water. Once these rocks are broken down into those smaller pieces, they are then transported by those same mechanisms, primarily wind and water. And this transportation from one place to another is referred to as erosion. Weathering and erosion are coupled together most always, but they are two different processes. And we know as we looked at in our depositional environments activity that these modes of erosion, wind and water, can have a range of energy levels. Wind can be anything from a gentle breeze all the way up to a raging hurricane. And a raging hurricane can certainly move uh, much heavier, larger pieces of sediment or rock than can a gentle breeze. And that's because it's a much higher energy depositional environment. Same thing with water. This comes down to streams, waves, ocean currents. You guys probably saw that in that same activity on depositional environments that many of them were named after the mode of water transportation. So marine, uh, stream bed, delta, floodplain, meandering river, the list goes on. And this is because the majority of erosion it takes place via water. Water often uh, moves with a lot higher energy and can create a, a much wider range of depositional environments. We do have some depositional environments that are dominated by wind. Those we refer to as aeolian. Now, as far as weathering goes, there are actually two different types. One is mechanical weathering, and secondly, we have chemical weathering. Mechanical weathering is the physical breakdown of that rock into smaller and smaller pieces without changing the chemical composition, and this is the majority of all weathering. However, we can also have chemical weathering where rocks are broken down into minerals um, that uh, in go through a process that changes their composition where they become entirely different substances. Rusting would be a, a prime example of this process. But there are many different types of both mechanical and chemical weathering that we'll get into today. One type of mechanical weathering is referred to as ice wedging or frost action. This refers to the process by which um, there is an existing fracture or crack in a rock um, or sidewalk as in this picture where during the warmth of the day, water is melted, it's in liquid form, and it can infiltrate those cracks. Come nighttime and cooler temperatures, that water will freeze and expand. And that expansion will occur in all different directions, as shown in the figure here. So if you'll recall from the previous lecture on metamorphic rocks, we have uh, several different types of stress, and one of those is tensional. And tensional, usually we're talking about a, a pulling apart action, but this can also be a result of expansion. So in this case, with the ice or the water freezing into ice, it will expand and exert tensional force on the, ex the surrounding rock and can fracture it further and create a larger space for itself since it requires a greater volume. Come the re repeating of that cycle where we have the warmth of the day that will thaw it out and melt it, it will be able to melt and infiltrate down further into its newly enlarged fracture where once it becomes cold enough again, it will once again freeze and expand and crack it further. Over time, this continues to repeat and eventually we will get a large split or crack in that rock or that sidewalk 
Um, another example of this might be your car windshield. It's If you have a chip in your windshield, it's best to get that fixed before winter comes um, because this freeze-thaw cycle or frost wedging can take place in your windshield, which is what turns what was once a small chip in your windshield into a massive crack going all the way across your windshield. With enough repeated cycles of this, uh, eventually we can take something like this boulder and turn it into a relatively fine sediment. Another common cycle that we see in mechanical weathering is that of wetting and drying, or in other words, hydration and dehydration. In drier and hotter climates, such as the western U.S. Uh, with desert-like conditions, these structures, referred to as mud cracks, are very common. And this is a result of the hydration or wetting of this clay or silt-rich sediment uh, and then later dehydration of it. The interesting thing about these structures is that the entire uh, floodplain or mud flat is treated as one singular body. If you look closely, you can see that we have some major fractures or major cracks within this. They are deeper, they connect all to each other, they are uh, more easily identifiable, and then within these sort of plates almost, we can see some finer cracks that mm, don't necessarily connect to each other or very poorly connect to each other, and they're not nearly as deep, and they're quite a quite a bit fainter than the major cracks. And this is because this has undergone several cycles of wetting and drying. Clay is a very absorbent sediment. This is why it's a common constituent of cat litter. Um, and when it becomes hydrated, all of these cracks completely disappear. When the body is fully hydrated, it will just appear as one smooth, flat surface of mud. However, once drier conditions return and there's no longer availability of that water and the water within that mud um, evaporates and is carried away, we will see the exact same cracks in the exact same positions, at least these major cracks, and then we will see also that these finer cracks have become deeper and that we will have the addition of new finer cracks. So with repeated cycles of this, it will become more and more cracked. And eventually this will break it down from a clay to silt site sediment into a very fine powder. Some of you may have done a skincare routine or a beauty treatment, self-care, that sort of thing where you're putting on a mud mask. Um, number one, those are made primarily of clay. Bentonite clay specifically is a really good um, component to have within there because it, it is sticky to certain um, toxins that can build up on the skin. Nothing that's toxic necessarily to you, but can cause uh, breakouts and acne and um, roughness or patchiness irritation on short. Anyways, it, once you put this on, it a sticks to your face and is fully hydrated. You leave it on for a while and eventually it cracks off into something that's very satisfying to peel off. Now, if you were to count the number of cracks or fractures that you saw on your face before peeling this off, and then instead of peeling it off, re-wet it or rehydrated it and allowed it to dry out again, you would find that you would have both the exact same cracks that you had before, at least for the most part, uh, plus approximately 50% more smaller fractures or cracks within those original cracks. This is where you can actually see that cycle taking place in real time. Another type of mechanical weathering that is ironically also adjacent to skin care is exfoliation. And exfoliation is exactly what it sounds like it might be. Um, so if you exfoliate your feet with a rough pumice stone, the way that that happens is uh, essentially the same as a surface rock being exfoliated by other material and a material that's harder than it and can scratch it. Typically what we see this as is the form of glaciers passing over a surface rock. Number one, glaciers uh, move and that's because they uh, are actually melted at the bottom. So this sheer overlying weight of the glacier 
is what forces it to melt at the bottom. If you take an ice cube out and put it on your countertop, it will actually melt faster at the bottom of the cube than the top of the cube because of the weight of the cube. And then if you give it a little nudge, it should slide right across the countertop so long as it's clean and smooth enough. There's not a frictional force holding it back. And the reason why these moving glaciers can scratch these exposed rocks is because it's not purely water. These glaciers come from natural bodies uh, within these freeze-thaw cycles um, and built up an accumulation of dirt, rocks, cobbles, boulders, snow, ice, and it gets compacted and compacted over time. So this ice can actually be sharp itself, but more so it is carrying boulders and gravels and things that it's picked up and frozen within it along the way. And these rocks can scour or exfoliate whatever surface it is passing over. We can also see exfoliation as the result of uplift. And uplift occurs when we have some major compressional force exerted on uh, a massive rock body. So that compressional force again is, is something that is pushing against each other, slamming together, um, and this eventually will exert enough stress to break the rock in half and push it up at that midpoint, uh, that maximum of where the stress is exerted. During this uplift that will change the amount of pressure that is exerted on that because once it's uplifted there's a different amount of overlying weight on that bedrock. That change in pressure will then result in a release of internalized tension from having that weight on it, um, which can result in fracture or cracking and further breakdown of that rock body. Do this enough times and eventually we'll go from rock to sediment. Here's an example of where exfoliation has occurred due to a glacier, and the, the fun or interesting thing about this is that you can actually see the direction that the glacier moved in. And that's because uh, that exfoliation, that glacial uh, movement, is only going in one direction. It's in, in this case, it was sliding this way along a curved projectile. You can see that in these parallel repeats of the major exfoliation lines. So this is if you were to uh, sand a board of wood in one direction, in one path, over and over and over again, you eventually see scours or dig marks from where you've been sanding in that one spot in that one direction rather than a, an even circular motion. Similar to how frost wedging occurs, we can also have wedging due to plant roots uh, or general vegetation growth. Um, as trees and other plants continue to grow, their roots will expand and dig down deeper and deeper. As they continue to do this, eventually they will reach uh, a, a portion of the subsurface that is no longer soft sediment but is instead hard rock and it will find the small grooves or existing cracks or fractures, move into those, and then continue to grow and expand. As they grow and expand, they will wedge open those spaces, creating more space for themselves where they can continue to grow, and the cycle repeats itself. And again, you keep doing this, eventually you turn rock into sediment. Especially when you combine this with several other types of mechanical weathering, or perhaps even throw in some chemical weathering. This is a pretty good example of root wedging. Here you can see where this pine tree um, has grown into the subsurface, uh, this rock on this cliff, and has slowly over time pushed these two massive blocks of rock apart from one another, it turned what was once into one solid piece of rock into two completely separate pieces of rock. Each of these probably weighing uh, somewhere around two tons each. Now that being said, any number of mechanical weathering mechanisms can be combined together um, in addition to chemical weathering to speed up the process or expedite the process 
of breaking down a rock into a sediment. The most common type of chemical weathering is hydrolysis. Uh, the root of that word being hydro, meaning water, and this uh, often goes hand in hand with um, a lot of the mechanical weathering processes uh, because most of our weathering and erosion takes place via water. And there are many, many different types of hydrolysis reactions, but long story short, this is in any case where water can, the movement of water can react with existing minerals in that rock, such as feldspar, um, and this will precipitate a new, this will precipitate, meaning it will uh, result in a chemical reaction that will produce a new material. And one example of this is the interaction of water and a mineral called feldspar, which will produce clay. Uh, feldspar is a common constituent of many of the igneous rocks, so this is where we can have an environment that is made up of primarily volcanic rocks in origin, um, yet we can have a lot of mud present as well, that mud being mostly composed of clay, which is where we can then have the dangerous combination of volcanic eruptions and lahars or mud flows. And hydrolysis is not just a function of what minerals are present in the environment, but also the physical conditions, uh, the primary one being temperature. So um, generally speaking, the warmer the temperature, the, the more hydrolysis can occur. And this is because number one, water moves better when it's warmer. It, when it's colder, it freezes and that prevents motion. Uh, and number two, chemical reactions on whole of any kind generally uh, occur more frequently in warmer conditions. And this is because the warmer a substance is, the more energized the molecules within it are, which means the more they are moving around and bumping off of one another and interacting with each other. Um, and this allows those reactions to occur more frequently on whole. Oxidation and hydrolysis go hand in hand. Oxidation is simply a fancy term for rusting. Many of you have observed this on your cars, be it that we live in Michigan. And this is a, a result of oxygen, either in water or air, reacting with um, minerals susceptible to rusting within a body. So this is converting um, primarily iron or magnetite to rust or iron oxide. This process goes hand in hand with hydrolysis, of course, because things rust uh, faster when they're exposed to water because that oxygen becomes more readily available and that it's more likely to stick to that object's surface than is the water, uh, than is just the air. Also, the molecules are closer together in water than they are in air because it's in liquid phase rather than a gas phase. And this is exactly why you don't want to leave your gardening tools or lawnmower or bike or whatever it may be uh, out in the rain on the side of the garage or just in the flower beds, whatever it is. Because with increased exposure to the elements, including uh, rain or uh, snow, other water, um, it will undergo oxidation and it will rust. Now, if we have all those items stored away in our garage and we like, take a peek at them again in 150 years, even though they haven't seen the, li the light of day, they will still have some rust on them and that's because they're still being exposed to oxygen just in the atmosphere. Um, however, not nearly as much and not as close together and not sticking uh, as much to its surface as would rain or, or snow or again, whatever it may be as long as it's allowing water to stick to that surface. One of my personal favorites as to where we see this uh, blatantly shown in the rock record is in what's called fondly as BIFs uh, or banded iron formations. 
And these are the result of different periods in Earth's time where the atmosphere was somewhat rapidly changing between uh, an oxygen-rich environment and an oxygen-deprived environment. And we can see that, quite literally see it and read it from a chunk of rock um, by looking at the black and red layers. So those which are red are those which have rusted. In order to rust, you need oxygen because that process of rusting is called oxidation. So um, in those Red layers, that period of geologic time, the Earth was experiencing an oxygen-rich environment. And on the flip side, those black bands are when there, it, the atmosphere was deprived of oxygen. And this is important to understand because what can't live without oxygen? Any living creature. Or just about any living creature. Um, tardigrades are one example of a highly tolerant. Uh, I believe they're technically classified as animals. Again, that's tardigrades. They're, um, they're almost like tiny bacteria bears, but they can survive in extremely harsh, con harsh conditions. They've been known to um, live and thrive at the mouth of active volcanoes, and they have been sent in into space to successfully uh, hibernate. Um, or lay dormant for several years and then be able to come back to life when retrieved and brought back to Earth. But of course, we and other animals that we love, dogs, cats, whatever, um, would certainly not thrive in those conditions. Carbonic acid is yet another way that we can have chemical weathering. Uh, the carbonic acid, uh, this is what makes your soda or sparkling water fizzy. Um, it's also a common constituent of shampoo. Uh, it actually stimulates hair growth and this is the result of an, a dissolving of carbon dioxide in water to form a mild acid. This is why these fizzy drinks deteriorate your teeth and these shampoos while stimulating hair growth can cause a bit of dandruff. So there's two sides or uh, an advantage and disadvantage to both of those. And the way that we see this in natural environments is that it will slowly dissolve the rock. So in this image to the right, you can actually see where over time the rainwater or wave water has pooled on this rock and slowly but surely eaten away at it so there are now completely empty pockets where the deeper these get over time, the more water it holds um, and the more carbonic acid can eat away at it, the, the more surface area it has access to. And minerals containing uh, organic material or rocks that are organically based such as calcite or limestone are those which are most susceptible to the breakdown via carbonic acid. Uh, that's, again, relative or adjacent to the breakdown of your teeth due to the, your fizzy colas. There are much weaker bonds within organic material um, in comparison to something like metallic bonding in metals, or some metals, that is. Here's an example of a gnarled rock or a limestone that has been chemically weathered by acid rain. Uh, acid rain is, is rain that has high concentrations of that carbonic acid. Some of you may have experienced this. I remember when I was a kid I would leave some toys out in the rain accidentally and we lived near some uh, industrial area that produced a lot of sulfuric and uh, or uh, sulfur dioxide and, and nitrogen oxides, which would in turn, after uh, releasing into the environment and evaporation, um, encourage chemical reactions which produced a lot of carbonic acid. And the toys that I left out in the rain would become completely destroyed, the paint would be ripped off, um, or, or the foam or imaging would be dissolved entirely. Um, this isn't so much a problem anymore because these re releases are more regulated nowadays, but can still happen. 
Um, and while it does happen naturally, it is far expedited by some of these industrial processes. Um, some common ones being the automotive industry and um, coal burning power plants. There aren't many of those. That's it's a dying industry at this point. So not so much a, a problem as it once was, say, only 10 to 15 years ago. And this can actually produce some really interesting or cool looking patterns as well, just depending on where that water is pulled up over time um, and continues to eat through that rock. Um, yet another way to go from rock to sediment. And we've talked about how chemical weathering uh, occurs more in warmer and wetter climates. On, on the flip side of that, mechanical weathering actually occurs more in cold or drier climates because of those mechanisms that we went over. Ice wedging, of course, is more likely to occur in colder climates, and mud cracking, those hydrating and dehydrating cycles, are more likely to occur in those desert-like drier climates. But there are two other factors that are important to consider in the um, rate of weathering. Number one being the rock's resistance to weathering. This is mainly a function of the hardness of that rock. Um, you guys saw this in your minerals lab when you were able to scratch the talc with your fingernail, um, but you were not able to scratch the quartz with the glass plate. So the quartz would be much more resistant to weathering than would the talc. Talc is much easier to break apart because it has a much lower hardness. Additionally, I brought up surface area a couple times already in this lecture, and that's simply because the more uh, of the rock that is exposed to those conditions, the more can be broken up. And the more that is broken up, the more surface area will be exposed, and this continues to increase that rate at uh, an exponential increase, meaning the, that if I take one rock and split it into two, and then four, and then, and then continue doing that, eventually I'll have uh, hundreds of chunks of rock or pebbles maybe bordering the, the transition area into sediment, which will be much easier to break up um, using the same mechanisms as did that giant boulder, boulder that we started with. So the greater the surface area, the greater the rate of weathering. And the more we weather it, the more surface area is exposed. Here's a visual of that same com concept where instead of uh, having one massive block of rock where the only exposed surface area is the top, back, front, bottom, and sides, instead we have uh, several cubes, or many, many cubes, where we now have a, a hundred times this much, or however much it is, where there's, instead of just one top and one bottom and one uh, front and one back and two sides, we now have a hundred tops, a hundred bottoms, a um, hundred fronts, a hundred backs, two, and, and so on and so forth. There's just now an awful lot more of that rock exposed, and the more that's exposed, the more it can be weathered. So this process just continues until it's a finer and finer sediment. So as a quick recap, generally speaking, when you guys see a dry climate or you're thinking about a dry or colder climate, I want you to think mechanical weathering. And then on the flip side, when you see a warmer and wetter climate, I want you to automatically think chemical weathering. Chemical weathering of the Parthenon in Athens, Greece has actually been um, rapidly accelerated in the last some decades due to the industrial processes and air pollution which result in an increased amount of carbonic acid in the rain. Um, and as a result, a large chunks of the Parthenon actually have broken off and then and, uh, and then have come in close contact with the Temple of Athena, putting that in danger of some massive uh, mechanical weathering, or just sheer damage. But this has been recognized by their local governments, and as of the last five-ish years, 
Um, they have been putting forth some efforts to try and remediate this process or, or save what is left and, and reduce the amount of chemical weathering that is uh, affecting the Parthenon. So that's it on weathering. I will see you guys in part two after a quick brain break um, and we'll get into erosion.